God's grace and his mercy are yours in Jesus Christ. Glad to see you here today. We're in this series on the foundations of the faith. Uh, what are those foundations that we stand upon? And uh, it's interesting, as you heard those three readings, Heather, can I throw you a little curveball? Can you put up that Old Testament reading? Can you go to that slide? Is that easy enough? If you can't, we'll figure it out. There you go. Okay, keep going. Another slide. Okay, go on one more. Oh, no, go, go back. Go back one. Okay. Okay, now go forward. Uh, go left. Okay. No, um, all three of those. So I picked those. Those are not the assigned readings today, but they're about this foundation of, of us talking about sin. And let me just say this right off the bat. I think I should have done this the first time. When we talk about sin, this is about us simply being honest. This is just about being honest. I'll talk more about that. This is not meant to beat people down. It's not meant to be you know, I don't know, fundamentalist or we're trying to make people feel cruddy about themselves. It's not, that's not what it is. When we talk about sin, it's about being honest, okay? So when we, I picked these three readings and this first one, you, you may be very, very familiar with it, maybe not, but from the, from the, from the Garden of Eden. And it's so interesting because these temptations endure, don't they? I just wanted to share why I picked these three real easy, real quickly. And actually in this reading, it's, it's one of the saddest and also in an odd, ironic way, one of the funniest situations. If it wasn't so sad, it would really be very humorous in some ways. So, the, the, you know, the tempter comes and tempts Eve and, uh, and essentially asks the question, you know, did God really say this? Did God really say, and we understand that temptation, we've used it further. Did your mom say you had to finish all your homework before we went out? You know, or something like that. That you had to clean your whole room before you could start playing video games. Or, you know, we, we know those. Um, and she does well, doesn't she? She says, we may eat fruit, right? She says, we may eat fruit. God did say, right? We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. Now, forgive me. Hang with me because this is probably so elementary. I don't want you checking out because I'm going to say something you may not have noticed or remembered. But God did say, don't eat, right? If you, if you go online, it's like this meme. You had one thing. You had to do one thing right, right? Don't eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. But look at what she says next. Now, you have to be a little bit of a student of Scripture, and you can go check this out and see what God actually said to them. God said, don't eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden. Period, full stop. If you do, you'll die. But look at what she says. And you must not touch it. God didn't say that. Now, what does that reveal? This is, I went thinking theologically. This is why we do this. Thinking theologically. Why does this matter? When she says it, it, they mean good intentions. Don't you think they mean good intentions? Adam and Eve probably got together, right? And they said, hey, as long as we don't eat fruit from that tree, we're golden, right? So you know what we should do? We should probably build a fence and we should probably electrify it and we should probably put a moat, right? So that we won't touch it. We won't even say the name, right? Something like that. And so they, and you know what it says? Do you know what that says about human beings? This is our broken nature. It says to, it says, God, what God said was not enough. What God said was not good enough. I can do better. Ooh, bad place. That is a bad place to start. And rarely do we talk about that theologically. That's a bad place to spot, start. When, when Eve and Adam, you can be sure they kibitzed on this. It wasn't that one of them came up with it all by themselves. They were talking about it. And they probably meant well. But when you stop and you say, I know better than God, and the devil just goes, because what's the devil's next temptation? You won't die. He lies. Jesus says that in the gospel reading. He lies. He's the father of lies. And you bought into his lie. Why, you Pharisees, you crazy, dumb, ultra-religious people, you bought into his lie that if you're really religious, you're going to be okay with God. And God couldn't give... Uh, two rips about that God is you bought the lie and so the devil says you won't die but God knows that if you eat from that you'll be like him in other words the devil's saying God's holding out on you God doesn't trust you he doesn't think that much of you and if they had half a brain if they had just stopped and thought they'd have said wait 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 
We were the last thing made. We were the pinnacle of God's creation. God formed us with his own hand, breathed into us as he walks and talks with us in the cool of the evening. How could God love us more? You get what I'm saying? And they buy the lie. And then go to the next one, Heather, for me, will you? Thank you. Because if I was translating this, this is how I would do it, right? She so saw it was good for food, pleasing the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her idiot husband who was with her, and that doofus ate it too. That's how I would have written that. Because he's an idiot. He was, he was charged with caring for creation, wasn't he? Wasn't Adam charged with caring for creation? Here's my wife. Here, eat this. Okay. <laughs> You're an idiot. He should, what should he have said? He should have said, what have we done? And it would be we, not what, you, what have you done? This is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. What have we done? Let's go to our father. And that's not what they do. So you could just see sin. And doesn't it resonate? Doesn't it just ring true? These are among the first words in the Bible. And it resonates with us. We do it. This is what we do. We buy it. We buy that. And we go that way. And then Paul, I love Paul in Romans 7. I tell, I've told many of you many times, you should read it at least once a year. Romans 7 and Romans 8. Those two chapters. Read it at least once a year devotionally. Just trust me. Romans 7 is Paul is honest. Because think about Paul. Paul is the greatest of all New Testament apostles. He converts the Roman Empire. I mean, the Holy Spirit does it, but he is a powerful, passionate, willing implement of God's gospel, isn't he? And the world is transformed through the outpouring of the gospel through the mouth of Paul and other apostles. And Paul is so honest. He says, you know what? I know the right things to do. Can't, doesn't it resonate with all of us when you heard that read? And, and Susan, thank you. We call those the doobie dooby doo verses, you know. The good I do, I don't do. The do I do, and I do. it's a doo-doo thing, you know. Anyway, anyway, and essentially, in short, it's Paul saying, I know what's right. I want to do what's right. Why do I struggle so much? Anyone relate to that? I'm all in there. I know what's right. Why is my language not the way I want it to be? Why is my attitude not the way? I'm, why am I not more patient? Why am I not more generous? Why am I so self-centered? Why? I know, and I want to honor God. Don't you, people? We want to, don't we? We long to honor God. We want it to be a reflection. We want people to see Christ in us. And thank God, we are so blessed that so many times people do. Isn't it great? In spite of us half the time. But isn't it wonderful that people do? But even then, if we look in the mirror, we go, I want to do better. And I just love that chapter because Paul is so honest. Who will save me from this mess I'm in? I'm a hot mess. Thanks be to God, right? And my, just to give, you, give this away, my single favorite verse in all of Scripture is Romans 8, chapter, one, eight, chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's my favorite. And that's how Paul kind of concludes this and then goes into chapter 8, all these wonderful promises of God. But he's honest. That's my point. It's not that Paul is sitting there self-flagellating and saying, oh, I'm dirt and I'm horrible, I'm worthless. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, I want to do better. Thanks be to God that God hangs in there with me. And then the third one, the gospel, is Jesus saying, "Why the most, he's talking to the most religious people of his day. These are the people who, for Jewish people in Jesus' day, if they're, they look at the Pharisees and these scribes and teachers of the law, and they say, if they're not getting into heaven, who's getting in? These are the most religious people there are. They're like at church all the time. They're going to synagogue, they're studying the Torah and this and that, and Jesus just lays into them. You are illegitimate children. You don't do anything that Abraham, you say you're Abraham's descendants. You don't do any of the things that Abraham did. He believed. He had faith. He trusted. You don't do that. Oh my gosh. Jesus just wails into them. You, in other words, he's going all the way back to Genesis and saying, you have bought the lie. You bought the lie that you can be God and that you're keeping score. You're the scorekeeper. And so if I go to church this many times, if I give this much of my money to church, if I show off, if I wear the right clothes, if I don't hang out with people that are those schlubs over there, 
then I'm better than them. You bought the lie. So that's the context that we have. And so what I want to share with you here is it's easy to talk about sin. I tell people all the time, this is the one doctrine. I don't have to use the Bible at all to teach this one to you. I, hey, did you see William Shatner? Captain Kirk finally made it to t- space. So Captain Kirk makes it to space. Ten minutes. He was up there for ten minutes weightless. He's 90. Is that crazy? I feel very old now. But so uh, William Shatner got to go, what is it called? Blue Horizon Blue something. So he, Jeff Bezos thing. So he shot up into space and he came down and he, he made it. He did make a statement that I thought was awesome. I really appreciate it. He said, I hope I never recover. I hope I never recover from this. Just the experience of having seen that, what he saw. But, you know, it's funny, I, I, used, I wrote two letters to Gene Roddenberry back in the day, back when Star Trek was a thing, and, uh, and um, I wrote him a letter because I said to him, how come there's no, Gene Roddenberry is the creator of Star Trek, and I said, how come there's no chaplain on the Enterprise? Because it's, it's based on the Coast Guard, that's a little trivia for you, the military rankings and all that in Star Trek, Roddenberry used the Coast Guard as his example. And I said, you know, every major ship has a chaplain on them. You know, we have chaplains in all of those branches of the military. And you know why it is? Because Gene, he never wrote back to me, but this is why. Because Gene Roddenberry was convinced that in the future, sin would go away. Right? No racism, no money, no capitalism, no rich or poor people. That was his vision of the future. I mean, the only bad people were Romulans and Klingons. But for humans, we all got along. And the sad thing is, I mean, it's a lovely thought, but how's that working out for us? I mean, we haven't eliminated sin, have we? Now, I I talked about this a few weeks ago, and to be very honest, it is fair and honest to say, Thank God for much of human ingenuity, which God has given us in our minds and the desire to, to uh, improve lives and so forth, because poverty in, around the world, food distribution, things are very different from 100 years ago, very different. Infant mortality, uh, human, you know, slave, slavery and so forth. And there's, now, do those things still exist? Slavery, racism, poverty, disease? Yes, we got lots of work to do. But if you look at it from a simply materialistic standpoint, the human condition around the globe is far improved than it was 100 and certainly 200 years ago. Life expectancy, you know, all of that kind of thing. However, how we treat one another has, changed, has not changed. In fact, you could argue that it's gotten worse. I looked at a statistic that said, what's, what was the bloodiest century in human history based on historians' examining of wars and so forth? And far and away, exponentially, the 20th century. Just in two world wars alone, 60 million people were killed. 60 million in two world wars. The low estimate is 187 million people were killed in the 20th century. Not just from disease or from... You know, they died of natural causes, but they were killed. 187 million. In 1920, that 187 was 10% of the world's total population. That doesn't count. And I read another, another author who I respect greatly because he did mission work in China. And many of the things that we don't know about is how Christians were treated during the reign of Mao Zedong, communist China, or how um, Christians were treated uh, during the reign of Joseph Stalin um, in, in communist Russia. All that was hidden from us. Their estimates are that in the 20th century, a total of 300 million people lost their lives. So while our toys have gotten better, many of those toys have been used, and I use that flippantly, to kill one another. So this is my point for you. I'm not trying to depress you. Really, I'm not. I really am not. What I'm trying to do is to to be honest. Because isn't it interesting, right now, I listen to news and information from so many sources. I try to get it from every angle that I can get. I listen, 
and try to get different perspectives. And I have no idea who to believe. Are any of you running into that? I, I don't know who I can believe. I, I don't know. I guarantee you, if you only listen to one source, you're in trouble. I mean, and so I, I, that's a hard thing for me. I, I miss Walter Cronkite really bad. I'm dating myself again. Um, but, and so for me, that's why this is such a sanctuary. Coming to this place, I hope you know this. That when Chris and I are talking to you, we're trying to be as honest as we can possibly be. Because if we're not, how does that help? If we're not honest about our, our circumstances or our condition. So like, for instance, back in the day, let me show you this. Because there's a way to do it and there's a way to do it, tonally. This is a hymnal that was given to me at my confirmation when I was 13 years old in 1974. And this was the confession that we used to say. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto thee all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended thee and justly deserve thy temporal and eternal punishment. Whew. My brother hated that. He said to me, I'm not miserable. I'm not a miserable sinner. He said, maybe I'm a sinner, but I'm not a miserable one. We you know miserable. What does miserable mean? So we kind of got to define our terms. So we were in, in, in Disney. We were in Disney World in Florida. And so miserable is this. Miserable is going on the loop-de-loop backwards in the dark roller coaster just after having eaten an elephant ear. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's miserable. Um, I know that feeling. Where you just feel terrible and it's, you're just miserable. But that's not what the word means. Remember the uh, play Les Mis, Les Miserables? Victor Hugo's novel, uh, one of the great works of all time. That word literally means, well, you can translate it literally, the miserable ones. But what does that mean? Those needing mercy. That's the etymology of that word, those needing mercy. And so to be honest, that confession is a really good one. I am, a, I am one needing mercy, God. When we confess our sins, we're saying, Lord, I'm one of those. I'm one of the ones who needs mercy. And so we, we love, and I tell people this, so we visited a couple of churches in Florida, got to worship at one on Sunday, and it was great. It was a neat church like this. And it was funny because I, I said to Teresa, they, they did a cool service, very upbeat. It was this and that. I said, you know, they didn't talk about sin. They didn't talk about sin. I said, we'll never be a mega church. You know why we'll never be a mega church? Because we talk about sin too much. And, and, and again, I'm not trying to beat this into the ground because I'm going to get to the good stuff here in just a minute. Give me a minute. I'm going to get to the good stuff. What I'm trying to say is when we do this, when we because we have a confession all the time, we acknowledge our circumstances, we talk about law, we talk about God's law and how we violated it, it's because we want to be honest. Because here's the problem. Let's go into point number one. Here's the problem. Because I believe honesty is by far the best policy. If you're not honest, who can trust you? That was, that's kind of my point. When I listen to news and information, I just don't know if they're being honest with me. I don't know if they're telling me the whole story. I don't know if I'm getting, a, I don't know if I'm getting fair and balanced. I don't know. Who knows? And so I'm frustrated by that. So I have to go to God's word. Because in God's word, I'm going to get honest. And, and God's honesty with me is, I am broken and I am unable to heal myself. So like when I teach this in my class, I tell people, if sin is real, if we're grappling with the conditions of sin and the effects of a broken world, there's a few ways you can deal with it. One is you can give up. You can despair. You can do what Judas Iscariot did. Judas Iscariot ended his own life in despair. And confronted with his own failure, his betrayal of his Savior, he took his own life. You can ignore it. You can kind of ignore it. You can say, well... I'm no worse than the rest of those putzes out there. We're all in the same boat. So you just kind of say, I'm no better, no worse than them. Or you can say, I'm going to be better than you. Give me the list. That was what the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' day. Give me the list. I'll get on it. I'll be better than you. And hopefully God will like that. Or you can come to Jesus and you can say, like Paul did, Lord, I want to do the good thing. I don't do it wretched man that I am, who will save me? 
And Jesus says, I will. Okay, so that's where we're at. So the first thing is, whatever happened to sin, here's the problem. It's almost like we live in an era right now when sin is almost gone. There's almost like, it's almost like gone. Here's the reason why that's so insidious. Because the more sins that go away, the more God is eliminated. Because God is the one who gave the boundaries. God is the one who gave um, this far and no farther. God is the one who gave the law. Why? Out of love for us. Parents, you know this. Do your kids love all the rules you have? No. Do you have them because you don't like your kids? No. We adore our kids. And we would give anything for them. That's why we put boundaries in. That's why. And so clearly, whatever happened to sin, because eliminating sin eliminates God. The book of Judges has a theme. In the book of Judges, here's the theme of that. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sound familiar? That's today's theme, in my opinion. In our world today, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They lived as if there was no God. That's what doing this does. It eliminates God. And here's the thing. The problem is, point number two, there is sin. And it has material and spiritual impact. Paul says it very clearly. The wages of sin is death. We die because of sin. Death entered the world because of sin. But here's the more important one. I don't know if if you're familiar with this. Maybe many of you are. C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce. This is one of the most interesting examinations of heaven and hell that you might ever want to read. It's just really a great read. One of the things Lewis speculates on is that in hell, so he tells this story, and they're talking, there's these guys in hell, and they said, hey, can we see, can we see any of the really bad guys from history, like Genghis Khan, right, or Hitler, someone like that? And they go, well, the problem is they're like millions of miles away from here. And they go, why is that? Well, they're so bad that every time they do something, they move farther out. They do something, they move farther out. They move farther out, and they move farther out. You know what Lewis is saying? He's saying that's the problem. The greater problem of sin is not that it brought death into the world, but that it separates us farther and farther and farther from God. And the farther we are, the harder to come back, right? And we can't make that journey on our own. So God has to go searching. And God goes on rescue mission. God comes to earth. Anyway, that's one of the themes of Lewis's of book. Because in this, the problem is there is sin. Real people, 300 million people in the 20th century. 300 million. And that does not take into account other lives that many of us might include in that total as well. It does not include that. And so there is real material consequences People are destroyed. Families are destroyed. Communities are destroyed. There is real... And when we ignore it, or we don't speak truthfully about it, we actually encourage it. And so sin distances for us from God. It takes us farther and farther away. But now, here's the good news. Let me get the good stuff, because this is great. Let me start with this. Point number three. I got to show you this. This is from Gabe Flicker visited Constantinople, Istanbul, And it's a great big church there, biggest Christian church in the world called the Hagia Sophia, Holy Wisdom. So in the Hagia Sophia, and this is part of a mosaic which was actually rediscovered in the 1930s. So it was built as the biggest Christian, uh, like uh, Byzantium created as a cathedral in the world. And it was the seat of Christianity for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And this beautiful mosaic was designed. Now, if you look closely at it, you can see that on Jesus' mouth, there's a big gash, there's a big slash, and on his eyes, there's a couple of big slashes and another big slash. And you're welcome to look at this afterwards if you want to. It hangs in my office. You're always welcome to come and see that. And uh, it's just beautiful, and I'm grateful for Gabe uh, giving that to me, a photo that he took of it. But you see, in the 1400s, Islam came and took it over. And as they entered into it, they took their scimitars and swords and axes and they slashed the face of Jesus to, in disrespect, right? And then ultimately, after they went through that kind of purging time, they then slapped a bunch of plaster over it to hide the face of Jesus and the mosaics. And here's the interesting thing is, ironically, by doing that, they preserved it perfectly. 
They preserved it in the 1930s. They uncovered it and was revealed this gorgeous. Because here's my point. Why do I share this with you on this point? Point number thing, three is this. Sin doesn't change our value to God. Regardless of whether this was slashed or broken or whether people threw anything at this, tomatoes and rotten vegetables or whatever, whether it was covered up with plaster for hundreds of years, it never changed what was there, what its value was, what it was saying to the people. It does not matter what your history is. It does not matter what, it doesn't matter what you, what you were thinking or doing on your way into church today. That does not change your value to God. God has considered you of tremendous value. He knows you're a sinner. He knows I'm a sinner. This is God's great joke. He lets me be a pastor. It's stunning because I'm longing to live in grace, to be redeemed, to live as a redeemed person, a person who's been bought back. That's the proof. That's the proof. Sin does not diminish your value in any way to God. In fact, and my seminary professors might give me a little grief on this. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it. Isn't it interesting? Parents, you can relate to this. We want our kids to be perfect, don't we? We want them to be obedient and to follow our values and to live in faith. We want that. But when a kid fails or falls and is in need, what wouldn't you do? What wouldn't you do? That you'd never had to do before, what wouldn't you do to bring them back, to restore them, especially if they cried out to you? And longed for your healing touch. Isn't that what God does? So in some ironic, strange way, paradoxical way, God almost shows greater value to us because we're in need. So we don't go around sinning so that we can get God to love us more. That's idiotic. But because we are sinners does not diminish our value in any way, but in fact ignites the passion of God for his people. And he longs for that same passion to be our passion too. We who have known healing and grace, the same way to have that passion for those also. That's what I think got Jesus so angry in John chapter 8. They were not passionate for the people who were in need, for the people who were far from God, who were distancing from God, walking farther. They were just so self-content in their situation. And Jesus is longing for him to have the same passion. And then the last point here is sin doesn't diminish... Oh, no, sin doesn't d- diminish our value to God. Point number four... And God has overcome sin's consequences. So I'm in Disney. I'm in Disney World in Florida. I am not 35 anymore. I can't. When I was 35, I could do Disney. I walk four days, 12 hours a day. Walk, 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 walk. Keep walking. Uh, I had to take numerous breaks and naps and, uh, you know, disguise them in the guise of eating food or something like that. I can't do it anymore. I can't. Uh, I cannot alter the consequences of my aging. I can't. I mean, there are things I could do to be in better shape, blah, 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 yeah, fine, whatever. But I can't, in the end, alter the, the, the ongoing relentless progression of, cons- of that consequence. Jesus has. Jesus has overcome since consequences, but even more. Now, let me go on a limb here, too, because this is ironic, too. I'm a sinner and a saint at the same time. That's Lutheran theology. I love that we say that. I'm a sinner and I'm a saint at the very same time. And even though that sinner part is in me, God still invites me into his presence. God still longs for me to be here. I'm not here. I hope that you're not here because you think you earned the right to come into church today. I am hoping and praying that you came because you were longing to be fed to be cared for, to be forgiven, to be shown grace, to be blessed by being with other members of the community. That's what we're longing for. So God has overcome those consequences. And then finally, number five. So I, have, I had decided for several years that the worst drivers on the planet were from Utah. They're, they now live in Florida. I am not kidding. It's like NASCAR. And there are like millions of cars. I mean, Salt Lake City is still a relatively small place next to Florida. And they drive, they are insane. They're insane. And so I'm trying to use the GPS and I'm trying to find my way around and I just want someone else to drive. 
I, I just want someone else. These people are nuts. And I'm sitting there all the time going, I should have taken the insurance. I should have taken the insurance. I should have taken the insurance. Because um, I am sure bad things are going to happen. Here's the good news. So the car I'm driving, my life, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things I feel super blessed by. The spouse that God put in my life, my kids, the church, I get to serve you. I'm blessed to be on part of a team where we get to work. And there's so many things I feel so blessed by. But my car still doesn't function quite perfectly. And I, for one, am really, really glad that Jesus can drive that car. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's Paul. I want Jesus to drive that car. And the good news on that is, because my car still doesn't function perfectly all the time, but the good news is Jesus has a pit crew also. And so when my car does break down, and it does, the good that I would, I don't do. And the evil that I wish I didn't do, I keep doing that. When it does break down, I have a God who comes, and he guides, and he drives. He's my true GPS, right? My God positioning system. And so, and, and it's funny, when we were in Florida, after a couple of days, I'm like, hey, honey, I can find my way back to the hotel. Turn off the GPS. It did not go well. <laughs> and I had, I had to finally say, please turn on the GPS again <laughs> so I could find my way back. And thank God, this is the way I want my Christian life to be. Because I think too often I say, hey, Jesus, let's turn off the GPS. I think I can do this on my own. I can't. And so thanks be to God. I have a GPS. I got this. I got us. I have God's promise and word so that that GPS system is always on and it's always for you. Amen.